I got a bit of a confession to make. Ever since I picked up the AHP Alpha Tick 200X, I've been lurking around on Facebook uh, groups and forums and stuff like that, trying to figure out what most people want to know about this machine so I can put it into my review and I can put it into a bunch of other stuff and make kind of a really good video here, plus my honest review on how this machine performs and how I like it and all the rest of that good stuff. Sometimes I think this guy just talks way too much, so check this out. Don't blame the machine right away. Understand it's an $800 machine, uh, you know, not a $4,000 machine. And, uh, you know, practice, 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 because that's going to make it all perfect. So that's why I had to speed up this intro, because that's all I was really going to say. So here's my review. Here's how to set it up. Here's all the rest of that good stuff on this episode of the Fabrication Series. So one of the best things that we can do to get started here is to take a look at the machine and understand what all of these little knobs and switches and displays and all the rest of that good stuff do. That way you can get an idea of how to set it up, what to look for, and all the rest of that good stuff as you get it out of the box. Now up at the top left, that is your amperage readout. Now the amperage readout is only going to display your main amperage when you're not welding, and when you are welding it will display the amperage currently being output by the machine as you step on the pedal. That's if you could actually look at it. But it doesn't display voltage, it doesn't display anything else other than amperage. That's it. Directly below that we got some rocker switches. Now the top left rocker switch is your TIG or stick mode. So basically saying if it's set in a low position, that would be in the TIG mode, and if it's set upward or it's flipped upward, it's in the stick mode. Next to that is your AC or DC mode. That's pretty self-explanatory, up for AC, down for DC. 2T and 4T operation. Now if you're using this, you'll know what it is. If you're not using this, you don't know what it is, or you do know and you're not using it. Whichever way, if you'd like to know more about 2T or 4T operation, we do have a video on that. It explains it pretty well. But normally you would keep it in the 2T position, and you wouldn't be using it unless you're actually running on a trigger switch instead of the pedal. Directly next to that is your pulsar settings. Now the pulse settings is actually pretty easy to follow along here, but it is a three position switch and it references two different settings while it's turned on. Flipped all the way down at the bottom next to that straight line as it is shown in this picture means that the pulsar is not on. But if you flip it up to the middle, that is your high pulse frequency, and if you flip it all the way to the top, that is your low pulse frequency. Now we'll get into all of that in a little bit. Now let's take a look at all the knobs. Starting at the top left, this is your starting amperage. This is only used for 2T and 4T operation. If you're running on a foot pedal, these knobs won't even work. They won't do anything. So don't really worry about them unless you're working on 2T, 4T operation. But that is your starting amperage. Your main amperage is the main output that it's actually going to put out there. So then the main amps is your maximum amps as you're welding. So if you set it to 100 amps, it will go up to 100 amps and nothing more. If you set it to 150, it will go up to 150 amps and no more. Directly next to that on the right is the ending amperage. This is also part of 2T and 4T operations, so if you don't need to use it, don't worry about it. Right in the middle is all of our pulse menu, so the knob on the left has two rings around it if you look very carefully. It has an inside ring for low frequency and an outside ring for high frequency. This is your amount of pulses per second is what the frequency references. Pulses per second. So the inside ring, if you are set to the very top of the rocker switch position on the pulse settings switch, you will be referencing the inside ring as you set it up. So you'll be choosing anything from 0.5 pulses per second to 10 pulses per second. If you flip the pulse setting switch to the middle, you'll be on the high frequency setting, which means you'll be referencing the outside ring. So anything between 10 pulses per second and 200 pulses per second is what the machine will output. Right in the middle we have our pulse amps, or the base of our pulse amps. So what that basically means is if you set 100 amps on the main amps and you set your pulse amps or pulse base to 50%, you'll be getting 50 amps. So whatever you set on the high end, which is your main amperage of the pulse peak as shown, the low end or your pulse base will be whatever percentage of that you set on the pulse amps or pulse base knob. That's basically what that is. Simple math will tell you exactly what it'll put out. To the right of that, you have your pulse time on. This is how much time you want it to stay at the top or what percentage of time you want it to actually stay pulsing on the high end. On the bottom left is your AC frequency. Now this only works when you're in AC mode. It doesn't work when you're in DC. It can be set to anything and it's not going to do anything unless you're in AC mode. So the AC frequency is how many cycles per second you want the machine to bounce back between the positive and negative cycle. Now if you're not familiar with this, it's a good idea just to start somewhere around 120 hertz. That's pretty much dead center right at the top where it's at right now. Right next to that is your AC balance. 
how much of the focus you want on the negative side versus the positive side. Now this is where a lot of people get confused because the AC balance on this machine is focused on the positive side or the cleaning side of the machine, not the negative side. It is on the positive side, so if you switch it up to 65% AC balance, you're going to fry your tungsten in a big hurry. So make sure that you have it set to about 35% or less. Next to that is your post flow. This is how much argon you want to pump out of the machine after the arc terminates or how much flow you want to have. This is measured in seconds. So 1 second, 3 second, 5, 7 and up to 10 seconds is how much post flow it will offer depending on what you set it at. Usually somewhere between 3 and 5 seconds is a good solid place to have it. I usually set mine around 3 unless I'm welding stainless or titanium. So we'll talk a little bit about the machine and set up as you get it out of the box. Now the red side is your ground clamp or your work lead and that connects to the red side or the positive side of the machine. Then you're going to get your torch lead, connect that to the negative side of the machine or on the black side. So they're basically color coded, pretty hard to screw up, make sure the right colors go with the right colors. Then you snap your argon line in there and then grab a hold of the pedal or the torch switch, whichever one you want to use. Make sure it lines up, only goes in one way, make sure it's nice and securely tightened. Sometimes it uh, you know, doesn't work out perfect, but make sure it's nice and tight in there. Now this setup, as you see right here, this is pretty much every operation you're going to work on right here. This is exactly how it's going to be set up. Just about you know, 99% of it is going to be set up this way. Okay, this is electronegative is the setup for it. So it works on DC electronegative, works on AC. All you gotta do is set it up this way and you, unless you're like stick welding, you're not gonna need to flip it around for any other reason. So for TIG welding, this is the setup exactly that you need. So with setup out of the way, let's actually do some uh, review footage here and maybe show you about how it looks like, uh, at least the experience that I have out of it. So I'm going to start with some stainless and then we'll uh, we'll flip over to aluminum and show you some of that stuff. Now, the machine does surprisingly have uh, a rather smooth arc. It's very uh, fine control. It can be pinpointed. Um, I can, you know, really focus in on it, but, you know, the fans are a little bit noisy, which is to be expected out of an $800 machine, and what's kind of neat is this, this is the only machine that has the sound kind of like a jetliner, you can hear it as I taper out here. But realistically, it's not so bad, I mean, the fans, they're, you know, they're there, you can hear them, but the machine output... It's actually really good. This is the best I could get out of some stainless after a really quick run, and it's uh, it's actually really nice. It's very controlled. So now we'll switch over to aluminum. Now I am picky about aluminum. I weld a lot of aluminum, and aluminum is like my jam. That is my favorite metal to play with, aside from titanium. But you know, it's it's you can easily get it in there. I mean, the the analog knobs on it make it a little hard to refine precisely where I want it. But I have no legitimate gripe because once I you know laid down some beads and play with the coupons, this is the result I was getting: nice and smooth, easy to taper out, good amount of control on it. And then I started playing around with some other joints. Uh, you know, I did the butt weld there a moment ago, and then you know I'll jump in here and do uh, a T joint and uh, kind of knock this out here. I mean, there's there's even enough control to do like little quick autogenous tacks on the machine. So, you know, it's not it's not a bad machine at all. It actually, it, it just straight up runs. That's, uh, it's rather surprising. So, uh, you know, I did play around with this a lot. I had a lot of fun doing it. It's actually a really good uh, machine. There is something I can't stand about it. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. You know, here's some decent shots out of it. I mean, there was, I picked up some junk in the beginning of that puddle, but you know, it's 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 really not bad at all. You know, I got enough to do the edge weld out of it. You know, the whole works. It's actually pretty good. Now, just as with every other machine that I review, there's got to be a gripe, and you bet you, I definitely got a gripe on this one, and it's pretty much everybody's gripe. The foot pedal. The best way I can describe using this foot pedal is uh, by saying that it feels like I have to move my foot to the height of Burj Khalifa to get one amp of difference out of that machine. So it's not the most responsive pedal in the world. However. Uh, there is a Nova foot pedal, and I believe one made by SSC, that is usually found on Amazon and a few other places uh, that's, that's a fantastic upgrade for it. So I definitely suggest doing that. The other thing is the uh, pedal likes to slip around uh, quite easily on the concrete. Now, you can get rubber bumpers to stick in the bottom of it. You can, I've heard of people like gluing it or sticking it to a plank of wood or you know put some rubber sheeting on it, but I found an easier way, which is to take the pedal, flip it 180 degrees, rest my heel on top of it, and use my toes to control it. And that actually, uh, for a lot of people that uh, have sat down in the welding classes here, it actually helps out with them too. But I would definitely suggest replacing this pedal. 
Now hopefully that sets you up and helps you out a little bit on some of you guys that might have been struggling with setting this machine up. And for those of you who were unsure about it, hopefully you got enough information out of it. Now I would definitely say that in this category of inexpensive machines or machines less than a thousand dollars that put out this with all these options on it, there's a lot of machines like that. But out of the ones that I've run, compared to the AHP, the AHP is probably the best in that category. Or at least it's the one that I would buy if I had to buy another one. Now there's a couple of other things that I would suggest with this machine. Or maybe if you're the type of person you're not sure if I want it or not, but here's where I actually see it being used. One, I think it's a fantastic backup machine. So maybe you have another machine, maybe a high dollar, whatever the case is. Sometimes they go down, it breaks, and you need an inexpensive uh, machine to keep on the shelf as a backup. This is a great machine to have. Or maybe you work on the side and you know, just have something at the house or something like that, or maybe you're just getting into welding. Either way, this is a solid machine to have. Or maybe you're even uh, just starting out welding and you just don't want to invest too heavy into something, but you want something that will produce some really good results straight out of the box. This is the machine to have. That's definitely what I would suggest or I would recommend the AHP for. Now I do know a handful of people that have been using these for a few years now and they actually run them more on the professional side. Me personally, I think there would have to be a few more upgrades like a better pedal and maybe some better consumables to uh, get it to go that far and maybe it'll make it that far. But everything that I've put it through, I would definitely suggest it's a good solid machine to have at least as a backup or as a starter machine or anything else like that. So hopefully that helps you figure it out. It's a pretty good, pretty good machine for, uh, for only $800. So either way, if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and drop them in the comments box below. We'll definitely try and get back to you. You can also send us an email on the fabricationseries.com website. Hit us up on Instagram at the.fabricator or facebook.com slash the fabricator series. Now check the description. All that information is in there. I want to thank you guys for watching as always. Don't forget to subscribe to the Fabrication Series YouTube channel for more really awesome content, and I'll see you guys on the next episode.